Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. It's such a blessing and a privilege to be here. I, uh, Pastor Jack and Pastor Doug, I have had the privilege of being with them for a number of years down at the police department. and I'm ever indebted to them for the ministry that they have. Sometimes you look in the military, it's a band of brothers, but sometimes it's just the believers together, and we've been through thick and thin. And I can't tell you how thankful I am for them in my life and the blessing they are to me. And now that I've met other pastors here and other people here, this is quite the family. It is quite the family. Tonight, I want to talk about something that we've done tonight. This young group of people leading us in worship. I'm going to be reading out of Psalm chapter 34 in a few moments, the, verse, the first seven verses. And then I'm going to share a little bit about my life because nobody here really knows me other than what you just heard, or a few people have heard a few things, but you'll understand why I'm picking this passage tonight. Because this passage has one verse in it that is so important to me and has been since I was born again in 1970. That's a long time ago. In Psalm 34, let's read this together. And I want you to pay particular attention to verse 3. That's the one I want to highlight. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Now, we could go on and read all of this, but tonight, this one verse, O magnify the Lord with me, has been part of my ministry since I began. It wasn't like I just woke up one day and God gave me that verse. But it was something he bred inside of me at the very beginning of when I began to believe in Jesus. I was not raised in church. I looked a lot different than I do now. I wasn't a bad kid. My dad was a law enforcement officer. I swore I'd never be anywhere near law enforcement. He's with, the, he's with the Lord, and I'm sure he's been uh, totally entertained for the last 34 years I've been working with officers. But in 45 years of ministry, I've been seeking to lead people to understand always just how big God is. To always be reminded that there's nothing in this world that's bigger than him, more powerful, more significant, more threatening, that he can't deal with and he has a solution for. As I told you, 1970, I received Jesus as my Savior. I knelt by my bed. I've been going to a Bible study, like all teenagers oftentimes do when they're at a point in their life when they don't know which way to go. I'd been getting into some trouble, uh, which wasn't making my father happy, nor my mother. But I had one woman in our household, my grandma, who constantly preached Jesus to me, and she would make me so angry. Her name was Effie Gillespie Barnett. Had the blue hair and the little glasses. She always talked to me about Jesus, and I thought she would never stop. But I knew she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, until I began to go to a Bible study in the middle of the week, like this. I listened to college students lead this high school group of kids we talked about Jesus out of a J.B. Phillips New Testament. See, I thought I was a good kid. I didn't rob banks, didn't kill people. 
There was one night when the Holy Spirit hit me so hard, I realized for the first time I was a sinner. That in thought, word, and deed, I had offended God, hurt people, hurt family. Out of the blue, it was like I was struck in my heart to realize what I really was, and it broke me. And I went home, grabbed a little black Bible that I'd been kind of hanging on to. Never read it, but I felt like I needed to hold on to it when I prayed, and I asked Jesus to come into my life. Because as I listened to people talk about Jesus, he was the solution to everything. And I was at that point in life where I knew I needed to make a decision. And I didn't know why that, but that night I prayed the sinner's prayer. But nothing changed in my heart that I could tell. I didn't feel anything. But I figured, you know, this time I've got God on my side. Okay, I'm good. Most people, when they invite Jesus into their life, they tend to think things are going to get a lot better. I'm saying this because sometimes we don't understand God's plan until farther down the road. But three months after I prayed that prayer, everything in my life went wrong. My dad suddenly died at a night I was at a Bible study. While I'm hearing about Jesus, singing worship songs, I get a call. You need to get to the hospital. My dad was gone. You know, everybody looks forward to their graduate. I'm 17 now. They're looking forward to graduate. I was going to graduate at 17 years of age. And my mom's looking at me and says, take me in to see daddy. You know, everybody's counting on their dad to help them figure out where they're to go and what they're to do. I just became a Christian. I walked out of that room. Remember at the funeral, the words I hated the most. Somebody coming up and putting their hand on my shoulder and saying, son, you're the head of the household now. See, I wasn't the only child, but I had two brothers that were pilots in Vietnam. They were gone. One was on a carrier, the Enterprise. One was flying out of Da Nang. So the pressure was now on me to figure out how to help my mom and my sister. But you know what? I was going to take that on. I was going to do it. I applied to the University of Missouri. Right after I applied, they sent me a letter rejecting me because my SAT scores weren't very good. So I lost my dad, got rejected from the university. My grandma, three months after that, came into the room, looked at my mom and I, and said, you know, I'm not feeling that good tonight. I'm going to go to bed early. She walked off. I watched her walk off and go into her room. My mom looked at me. She said, you better go tend to grandma. So I got up and I started following her. I walked around the corner. I, as I walked in, she had an easy chair and she sat next to her bed and she put her head back and I watched her close her eyes. I reached over and I said, Grandma. I grabbed her wrist and I felt her pulse stop. I kept thinking, what is going on? Called my mom. Grandma was gone. The one had witnessed to me and shared with me. Why was I the one that was there to felt her heart stop? Things weren't making sense. One more thing, I got my draft notice to Vietnam. If things, oh my goodness. So I have two brothers. The Navy started coming, knocking on the door. Flew me down to Pensacola. Got to let me land on a carrier. Flew in an F-4 Phantom. Oh, that was something, a rush for a young man. But when I got home, a close friend of mine down the street I played Army with as a kid was sent home in a body bag. So I'm just like, Lord, Dale, what, Lord? And all of a sudden, I realized with everything caving in, I looked back at the time I prayed the prayer, and I couldn't figure out if Jesus came into my life, what's the point? Things didn't get better. I couldn't even see heaven. I couldn't feel anything. But you know what? This is why I'm going to tell you this. God has a deeper wisdom than we understand, and it all came down to this one simple fact. He wanted me to not just hear how big he was. He didn't want me to go off a secondhand experience. He didn't want me to read it in a book about how big God was, or just to read it in here. He wanted me to begin to live some of this right here, and the only way he could do it was take away all the security 
and all the future and all the hope I had in this world, and I had to make a decision. I'm either going to be a believer and a follower of Jesus, or I'm getting out of this. And I told him, you know, Lord, I'm not going to be a coward and I'm not going back. I'm going in with both feet into this. I don't know. I don't have a solution to any of these problems. But if you're the Savior, I need your help. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't even know where to look. So he and I began to talk. The result was I decided I wouldn't be a victim. I wasn't going to be angry at God, though my flesh wanted to. I'd be the kind of person that truly would trust him, and I didn't know why. I wanted to live life looking forward and not always looking back. There's way too many people. It's so easy to look at everything that's gone wrong and not keep your eyes on the, ones who can make every, the one who can make everything right. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And I made the decision. I had no feelings. I didn't make the decision out of feelings. I made it a decision because I really had no other way to go. You know, you can live life with the big windshield of faith in front of you, or you can live with regrets looking in the tiny little rearview mirror, always looking back to what happened or didn't happen. And if you look too much in the rearview mirror before long, you crash. And so I just decided, and I'm, I'm looking back, Lord. Read that little scripture like Paul wrote. One thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind, I press on. I didn't even know what that meant. But I said, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving out. I'm not giving Jesus. I don't know what that means. Let's go. And I prayed one simple prayer I'm going to mention to you later from a very important story in the Bible. But God's word became alive to me. I, it wasn't just something I read on the page. All of a sudden, it was as if God highlighted the Bible, that little Revised standard black Bible, I'd open it up and it would jump at me. I didn't even know that passage. It said that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. I didn't know that. But he started guiding me into truth. Passages which I could never forget. Passages like, be anxious for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which passes understanding. Will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I don't just say that because I wanted to impress people that I memorized it. I've said it so many times in all these years. The first time I said it, you know how the Holy Spirit taught me? He asked me a question after I read that. He said, how much is nothing? And then he said, how much is everything? Be anxious for nothing. In everything, no matter what's right, what's wrong, is God big enough to handle it? Can I trust him enough and give it to him and give it to him and trust that he has a solution, even though I don't know which way it's coming from? I don't even know sometimes why I'm here. But see, as I look back at that moment, the reason I brought it up is because it changed the direction of my life forever, that Jesus wasn't just someone I believed in. Jesus is someone I follow. Even sometimes where I don't know exactly where he's leading, but he does. We walk by faith, not by sight. So I started going to church regularly, studying his word, learned how to worship, played, learned to play guitar. We were just talking about that, Pastor Gerard. We're, everybody out of our area, you all had to learn the guitar if you were going to be in church. So we sang, we worshiped. God brought a huge answer to me. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. You know that word anxious means, if you really want to know what it means, it means to have overwhelming care. We get so caught up in caring about what's going to happen, it, it gets out of control. When it says be anxious for nothing, that means, like the Bible says, cast your care upon him for he cares. He always can out care me. And I've learned to keep giving things and giving things to him. 
and he takes all the fear and the messes. When his hands touch the things that I see, that anxiety, that overwhelming care is me trying to control things I can't control. Was I going to call the U.S. government and tell them, excuse me, but uh, my brothers have done their part. Isn't that enough? My dad wasn't going to come back. But do you know what I found out? The first thing God addressed for me was this. The scriptures say that he's a father to the fatherless. When my graduation day came. I was a little discouraged and depressed because everybody's parents were in the stands. I mean, some of us had been through this before. I can see my mom. I can see my little sister. When I'm sitting in the group of kids, all I could hear was that one passage, I'm a father to the fatherless. I'm your father. Trust me. Just trust me. You know what happened after the graduation? University of Missouri, out of the blue, decided to call me. And they said, we'd like for you to come into our office. We just want to talk to you. So I went in and I showed up. My SAT scores weren't going to change. I have always been horrible at standardized tests. From the time I was in elementary school, they would call my parents in and say, you know, your son, uh, he doesn't take standardized tests very well. But I thought their questions were ridiculous. When I was in elementary school, I lived in the Midwest. This is Missouri. We say Missouri back there, not Missouri. It's in Missouri. They had a question. How do you start the tractor? Step on the pedal. Turn the key. Push the button. None of the above. Have they ever driven a tractor? The tractors I drove, you had to step on the clutch, turn the key, and push the starter button. And that wasn't on there. There was none of all of the above. And so I'd get, get it wrong. And they'd call me and say, why'd you answer that way? Well, because you ever driven a tractor. I don't think that's why the University of Missouri called me in. But they called me in, and you know what they said to me? You know, we realized that um, your SAT scores, but we're, we're pretty low, but we're going to give you a shot. We're going to put you on probation. If you can keep your grades at a B level after the first semester, we'll let you stay. I said, Lord, are you going to help me keep my grades at a B level? <laughs> you know, uh, it's amazing when you allow him to guide you, he will help you in that. I would sit and pray before each exam. And Lord, I studied the best I could. You know I gave it the best I could. Please bring to my remembrance everything I need. And a C student in high school became a B student at the university in the undergraduate level. But there were other problems that needed to get solved in that first year. The draft. Do you know in that year they changed from just calling us in, they went to a lottery? The Navy wanted me to sign, and I prayed, and the Lord said, just wait. I sat with my best friend, Dave Chapman, in the commons, the University of Missouri, and there's the radio blaring, and all the men are sitting around listening, the young men waiting to see it, what number would their birthday turn out to be. Dave, my best friend, got number 35. If you were 100, under 100, bye. You were going. You could hear the room. Hundreds of young men listening. Some of you remember that. Some of you served. Honorably served. My brothers did. The Lord saw fit to give me 222. But I was ready to do whatever God wanted. If you want me to go, I'll go. I like flying. The Lord had a reason. Because my one brother flew out of Da Nang. He passed away just not too long ago. I had the privilege of being there when he received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. And during his service, I got the privilege of standing there and watching his two daughters. One received Jesus right there. 
both of his daughters are serving as missionaries. Their husbands, their families, one's in Nicaragua right now, leading children, young people, in Christ through baseball. They teach them baseball and they teach them Jesus. And those kids carry their Bibles and they carry their gloves. But where did it all go? God had a plan. So humbling. He has a plan for all of us. It's working right now. There's nothing that really in this world should intimidate us because God has a plan. And every problem we face has a purpose, even the problems. Iron sharpens iron. We find out among each other that we, in our times that we come together, we're changed. But there are times when it's just us and the Lord. He puts us through the hammer, the file, and the furnace, like Chuck Swindoll used to say. And we come out different. We come out in the image he wants us to portray of himself. I decided throughout the rest of my life, I would remind people how big God was. I felt sad that I didn't get to say anything to my grandma. What I didn't realize is because I felt her heart stop, my mantle fell on me. And all the grief I felt when I was going to the Lord and apologizing and feeling guilty about all the anger I had towards her because she was telling me the truth and I didn't want to hear it. I realized what that grief really was, was love that had no place to go anymore. That's what grief is. The love we have for somebody that can't be delivered there anymore, but we can honor them. So instead of just attending Bible studies and going to church, I began to lead. I'd lead the Bible studies. I'd play the guitar and do the worship in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ and a blue-haired disciple of his. I'm sure even right now, she knows exactly what I'm doing tonight because Jesus is so loud. All this time, he began to see how big God was, that none of us are at the mercy of anything. We're only at the mercy of God. Now think of that. As we look at this world and we hear all the politics and all the threats and all the doom and all the gloom, do you know who's in charge? Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're here with a purpose. Did you ever read this and see all the situations Christians got into and well, in the Old Testament believers got into that God led them into? Why did he do that? To make their life miserable? To demonstrate his power. That his power is perfected in our weakness. He chooses us. You are here for this time. Every single one of you. It's not an accident you're here. God chose you with all your unique gifts and talents, all the experience you have to use you in this time in a world that's getting darker, more fearful, more anxious. There are people who become lights and dispel the darkness and make an eternal difference because our God is so big. This world thinks somewhere, so many Christians I've talked to think that he's somewhere not paying attention. And that's not true. A year ago, and then we're going to get, you're wondering, is he ever going to get to that scripture? Oh, hang on, hang on I, I promise. A year ago, at Christmas, I was diagnosed with cancer. You know, we found a knot right here on my neck. My doctor looked at it. Oh, don't worry, it's a lipoma. Oh, that's okay. Do I have to worry about it? No, don't worry about it. So I went home. Kept feeling it. It's still getting bigger. So I went back. I said, hey, you know, this kind of bothers me. I said, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll just take it out. So they just decided to take that little portion of it out, and they tested it and sent it in. She goes, she took it, I even looked at it. She says to me, oh, it's, it's just a lipoma. Okay. Yay. About a week later, she calls me, and I can hear in her voice. She was scared. She goes, you, uh, it's not what we thought. It's called atypical fibrosanthoma. It's a very rare cancer. She goes, I need to take you in for more surgery. When you go in for surgery, I need to let you know that when I cut down into here, I'm going to go very close to your ability to speak. So 
So I had the surgery. And it was exactly what they said. She said, I think I got all of it, but there's these spindle cells down there and I can't take a chance. She goes, I need you to go through six weeks of radiation. Now, see, as, as a Christian, we think, well, Lord, what are you up to? I mean, really? Really? I mean, couldn't she just get it all out? I mean, we all think those things, right? Like, Lord, really, what are you up to? But remember, I put both feet in. There's no going back. There's no getting mad because I have to believe there's a greater wisdom. You know what I found out? In six weeks of going every single day to UCI Medical Center, I found out what it was like to go in the fiery furnace or in the lion's den. And you know what I found? There are people sitting in there without hope, governed by fear. You know, where we go, there we've been sent. So I'd go in and I'd look at that room, and, they, they were head, and there may be people here right now. You've been through it. People can hardly look up for fear. You know, I've always prayed all these years and seen God do so many miracles. And I kept thinking, well, why didn't you just take it away? Because he needed me to see something. To see the fear and the pain. To know more than sympathy, empathy. And take the good news into that place. Like Paul and Silas in a dungeon were there for a jailer. To talk for six weeks every single day, I had people I could encourage and pray. Because, you know, in reality, the only thing that's important is Jesus. And I said, Lord, if you send me in here, I'm not going to go in with any other goal than to magnify your name and let them know they're not at the mercy of cancer. It's not that we can't die of cancer. But that's only if Jesus says so. He's in charge. And it's wonderful to know that he's in charge of every breath we breathe. We just sang a song. All my life you've been faithful. Now I'm 70 years of age. And I can say all my life you've been faithful. I've spent 34 years seeing the worst of the worst that humans can do to humans. Just in October, I lost a young man in my church. His dad was a student of mine in high school. He was a young pastor I trained. I did he, his dad's and mom's wedding. October 4th this year, or actually October 4th, 2023. He was driving home on the 91 freeway to visit his girlfriend. This young man's a strong believer. She's a strong believer. They just began talking about their life. And a wrong way driver struck his car and he died instantly. You kept thinking, Lord, really? What are you up to? How, how am I... How, Lord, I've done this all my life with people on the streets, but this is family right here. 4 a.m. in the morning, we're weeping on their lawn. I did Jeremy's service, this young man. And Jesus walked right into that room. Young people who would have never taken a moment to ask the question, what happens when I die? finally had the appetite to ask the question. I stay close to his parents and sister. But they took the grief they felt at Christmas and decorated their house in honor of their son. And they took that grief which was love, and they put it in a place and communicated through everything they did at their house that so people would know what Christmas is all about. One of the very things that that young man at 22 years of age loved. In those times, you begin to think, Lord, we're not immune to hurt. We're not immune to pain. But thank you, Jesus, that it all has a purpose. You're doing something magnificent through us. 
And oh Lord, may we magnify you. May, may people get a bigger picture of who you are as they look at us. They see us not in just the pleasant times, but in the difficult times. We admire people like Daniel and Ruth. Why? Look what they went through. And look how they honored the Lord. And God says he'll take care of us always. And the one thing we need to always know is that he loves us. And that we have a part to play in this grand purpose. I wrote on a journal one night, I just know you love me. And that's all I need to know. One of the books I read as a young Christian, you may have Heard me mention the J.B. Phillips New Testament. In 1953, the year I was born, there was a believer, J.B. Phillips, who wrote another book. Your God is too small. When I was coming through my time of growth, that book began to speak to me. That I would never allow the circumstances of this world or anything that the devil could do to minimize my opinion of who God was and how much he loved me. And I wanted to remind people, it doesn't take much to remind you of that if you just look at the cross. Like the song says, oh, how he loves you and me. And a man that I had been following wrote these words in response to reading that simple book. He said, is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Anyone who has done him such a huge favor that God has to ask his advice? Everything comes from him. Everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. Always glory, always praise. Yes, yes, yes. Whether we experience gain or loss today, may we be found singing to our great God when the evening comes. And I look back all these years now. I don't know how he does what he does. Everything is particularly perfectly put together, even the difficult things. And when it's all said and done, I always tell people, we get to heaven, we think, well, you know what, God, I'm going to have a lot of questions for you. I'm, when we get together, I, I'm going to ask you, you know what's going to happen when we get to heaven? I, I, I'm telling you right this, no big prophecy. I'm just telling you the way it is. We're going to get to heaven. We're going to look at God in the face and we're going to, it's all going to come together. We have one word to say. Oh, that was it. Really? But, oh, because see, when I look back, if my dad would have been there, I wouldn't have been a believer. I would have trusted in the security and the plan that he had for my life. I was getting angry and bitter at the fact he was, I got called a narc every single day. But when he was suddenly taken, tied to his law enforcement, some of that pride needed to be broken. It was like scar tissue, it had to be torn out. And I couldn't trust in him. I could only trust in the Lord. Now you're probably wondering, is he ever going to get to that scripture? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 20. You'll recognize this passage because I want you to think on this as we bring this in the next 10 minutes down to the very end. I want you to go out of here, I hope, thinking tonight and tomorrow, how can I magnify the Lord wherever I go and whoever I meet? The story is recognized simply because there's a king involved by the name of Jehoshaphat. The date is 750 B.C. The place is Jerusalem. There's a crisis facing this individual He knows there's about to be a surprise attack from the southeast. Three nations suddenly move against Judah, Moab, Ammon, Menuhites. In verse 2, let's read a little bit together now. 
Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea. Just notice one word there. Did you see the word you? It's personal. It doesn't say that they were coming just against Judah. This attack, read the words, they're coming for you. That's what the devil wants us to feel all the time. That evil is coming after me. And he is, but not just me or you alone. But do you see how he can make it so personal? Where evil seems to be magnified. And Jehoshaphat heard that and he knew this was life or death. Let me read the rest of the story. Verse 3 what we call a pivot verse. Jehoshaphat was afraid. Is it okay to be afraid sometimes? It is, just important what you do with it. So Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. That This reveals the key response. Jehoshaphat res responded by deciding, I am going to seek the Lord. Everything turns on that fact. Why did I pick this passage? Because that's exactly where I was facing. When I first started following the Lord, and ever since then, when things come against me or against my family, there's only one place to go. Oh, we can talk to our friends, we can talk to doctors, but the first place to go is not our friends, doctors, or whatever. And don't trust politicians. Don't think that they're your future and your hope. There are people who are thinking this next election is going to solve the problems. Really? Politics and government can do nothing. But we know a kingdom that can do a lot to change things. Because we have a king who's working in the midst of all of this strange happenings. He's up to something. Jesus is up to something wonderful. And guess what? You're part of it. And so am I. For as long as he allows me to have breath. You see, when we read this, Jehoshaphat tells us something. It's not the crisis that destroys people. It's what we do or don't do when we face a crisis. Are we going to determine every single day to first and foremost go to the Lord? I was counseling a young couple the other day. They're having all kinds of problems. It's not uncommon. I asked them to do one thing. I looked at him and her. I did their wedding. We went through pre-marriage. But I said, when you go home tonight, do me a favor. Before you go to sleep, I want you to put your hand on her forehead and pray for her. And then I want her to pray for you. I said, I'm not asking you to put an egg timer on in this many minutes. Just pray for their health, their safety, a good night's sleep. And but I want you to pray out loud for your spouse. That's all I ask you to do. When, when we meet again, I'm going to ask you a question. You know what my question I was going to ask? Somebody want to tell me? Did you pray? You know what I found out? They made it one night. And I said, you know, I really can't help you right now because you're coming to me and there's one person who's greater than I. You want the real therapist? I just want you to talk to him. So another week went by and it's amazing what began to happen when they began to commit to going to the Lord for the other person. Pray one for another that you may be healed. They were discovering as they're praying, the Holy Spirit was inspiring them, breathing into them this life. They began to care again about the other person. And it was all over a simple, silly fight that, you know, pride gets in there. And But you can't stay prideful very long when you're praying. Jehoshaphat was smart that he called a fast. He wanted their appetite to be for God's solution. You know, anybody else in this day and age, knowing that an army is coming against you, would say, get everybody ready to fight. We'd have been calling for everybody to get ready to fight. 
And Jehoshaphat was smart enough saying, wait, the first thing we need to do is pray. I want everybody praying. That's what we should be doing for our nation right now. We have those prayer closets. I've been getting up a little earlier lately. So many hurting, fearful, angry, bitter people that need Jesus. I'm not smart enough to reach them. I'm not talented enough. I can't get anybody saved. I've been praying that God gives them an appetite to ask me a question. Or ask the people in my church a question. We have a vast mission field out there. and So everywhere I go, there I've been sent. It doesn't matter if it's a Starbucks, Target. When I go in, I'm looking for what God has, and what God wants to do because he's so big. Did you know he's there? Did you know God's in Target? Did you know God goes to Starbucks? He's everywhere. He's not just in church. We get the privilege of representing him and magnifying his name. It's so easy to tell people, well, I go to church. You know what's the harder thing to say? I'm a Christian. Christ is my Savior. See, the socially acceptable thing is, I go to church. Well, what church? This church. But when it comes down to the real nitty-gritty part of it, Jesus is my Savior. I'm his child. I better read on. Got to keep up. Almost done. And then it says, So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not the ruler over all the kingdoms and the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. I've got that marked in several colors over and over again. And this is my new Bible. Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O oh, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? They have lived in it have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you. For your name is in this house and cry to you in our distress and you will hear and deliver us. Now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they're rewarding us by their coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we're powerless before this great multitude who's coming against us. Here's the key verse. You've been waiting all this time for this tiny little prayer. It says, and just remember, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. When you are in a situation where the enemy has come against you and you don't have the solution, Lord, I don't know what to do. My eyes are on you. Your servant's just waiting. I'll do what you say. But I'm going to stand before you. When I wake up in the morning, I'm going to talk to you. When I go to bed at night, I'm going to talk to you. And I just wait because I know you're big enough to do anything, anytime, anywhere. I know your power and I know your love. I trust you. That is what makes this life more than just a cumbersome thing we get through until we get to heaven. It's an adventure. I wish I could take you with me sometimes to the things I have to go to. I've been in situations where gang members are together because one person died in a family and they're blaming each other. And they're ready to fight and officers are there thinking that by their authority and their power, maybe they can keep something from happening. 
And sometimes those officers, after 34 years, who they call me Chappie, Padre, I get all kinds of names. They'll look at me like, do you, do you have an answer? And I look around, and at that moment, you know what? I don't know what to do. But I think, I'm watching you, Lord. What are we going to do? And you know how the Holy Spirit does something on the inside. And I remembered and I looked and I said, I need to go in and see the man who's passed away. And everybody saw me get up and go in and he's laying on the floor. A senior that all these people, young men had known. They're all angry, ready to fight because one didn't seem to take enough care. So much, I don't know. I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, call them all into the room, all of them. So I went out and yelled at the top of my lungs. I need all of you to come in here. Everybody in here, come in here right now. And they're looking at me like, who are you? But they started coming in. And they gathered around. There was no room for anybody else in the room. And I said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to commit this man that you all know to the Lord. Would you kneel with me? All these big, young, strong men. We all knelt. I put my hand on his forehead and I asked Jesus to intervene. To somehow move into that room and do what no psychologist, no therapist, no officer, no smart preacher. And God moved into the room and I began to see tears coming down my eyes. We prayed in one simple name, Jesus. When it was over, everything was quiet and the peace that passes understanding was entering into hearts. Not because I was smart. Remember who God chose in Christ to be his disciples? God's chosen the weak things of the world. The foolish things of the world. Do you know what the word foolish in Greek is? Moros. You know what other word we get from that? Moron. Pastor Jack's taught you. Here I am. I'm a Charlie Brown, if you remember. <laughs> Blockhead. but I know the name. And I watch the Lord move. Officers watch the Lord move. I don't bring much to the table other than I'm bold enough to go where he sends me and say one name, Jesus. Tonight, that name, Jesus. If you feel surrounded by an adversary, if you're facing a dilemma, if you're Confronting a threat, it could be in body, soul, or spirit. Nothing is stronger than Jesus. He's here right now. He's here for us, every one of us individually. And I'm going to say a simple prayer. First, I'm going to thank God for you. You are awesome people chosen by him. You can sit in the farthest corner and think God doesn't see you. Oh, he sees you. I tried that. It didn't work. And he's choosing you tonight to let you know how much he loves you. How much he's gifted you. If he's in your heart, you have all you need. So, Father, as we get ready to close this service, I thank you for these people. These men and these women, I thank you from every walk of life that they come. All the experiences they've been through. The Lord, you'll take all of those things and use them in a powerful way to reach this world. You'll send them as lights into the midst of other people's darkness. May your Holy Spirit fill their life, flow through their life, work in their speech, enhance their prayer. I ask blessing upon this fellowship, the blessing you, Lord, can give and are willing to give to all of us, Lord. I thank you for Pastor Jack. Be with him, his wife, 
all the pastors, all the Sunday school people, all the people that do the cleaning, everyone that serves you here, anoint them, Lord. We honor you tonight. We magnify your name, Lord Jesus. We give you glory. And we don't forget all you've done. We will always exalt your name together when we're in fellowship. In this last song, Lord, receive our praise. Receive our worship. It's in your name, Jesus. To your glory, Jesus. Amen and amen.